What? The Airbus has somehow become dangerously close to the ground. Come on! Climb! 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 Brazil in the late 1980s is a country in transition. Today, millions of soccer man Brazilians tune in as their beloved team takes on arch rival Chile. The critical match in Rio is all anyone is talking about, even a thousand miles away at Maraba Airport, where the crew of Varig Flight 254 is getting ready for takeoff. Varig Flight 254 is scheduled to fly north from the mining town of Maraba to Belém, near the mouth of the Amazon River. Captain Cesar Garza is flying the plane tonight, while First Officer Nielsen Zile monitors the instruments. V1, rotate. At 5.35 p.m., the Boeing 737 gets airborne. After 23 minutes, the flight computer tells the captain that they're getting close to Belém. The pilots try to contact controllers on the ground. Belém Tower, Vari 254, requesting descent. Strangely, they get no response from the tower. Belém Tower, Vari 254. Belém Tower, do you read? That's funny. What? We're not picking up the beacon either. Airports are equipped with very high-frequency omnidirectional range beacons, or VOR beacons. They send out signals that planes follow to the runway. Why don't we see if we can pick up a local radio station from Berlin? The captain tries to home in on a local radio signal, hoping it will help guide them toward the city. The do-or-die soccer game is being broadcast by radio stations all across the country. The pilots have managed to pick up a local station broadcasting the match, the captain is confident he's now on course. He's spotted a landmark on his radar. There we go. We're over the Amazon now. Belém is near the mouth of the Amazon. Following the river should lead the pilots to the city. But moments later, there's serious trouble. At 8.45 p.m., Flight 254 runs out of fuel. The left engine is the first to die. We just lost an engine! Hang on. I'm going to put her down. But there goes the other one! The inevitable impact is just seconds away. Just need to bring us down. Nice and slow. Of the 54 passengers and crew, 48 have survived. We have to get you out of here, OK? Can you hear me? Surviving the crash landing feels like a miracle to many of the passengers. But they now face a new threat to their survival. They're stranded in the vast Amazon rainforest with no food, no water, and no guarantee that they'll ever be found. No. Tucumán International Airport in Panama City. V1. Copa Airlines Flight 201 takes off for a short flight to Cali, Colombia. Rotate. Gear up. Captain Rafael Chial is Copa's most senior pilot. Today, he's monitoring the instruments. Set thrust to climb. First Officer Cesario Tejada is flying the plane. 40 passengers are on board, mostly business travelers heading home to Colombia. The flight usually takes about an hour. 
But tonight, there's a hitch that could add some time. We've got some heavy weather moving in from the Gulf. Flight 201 is heading straight for a storm. It looks clear to the east. The pilots need to find a way to fly around the bad weather. Agreed. I will let them know what we are doing. Panama Center, Copa 201. We'd like to get around this weather, requesting a new heading for 090. Copa 201, copy that. You're cleared on a heading 090. Cleared, heading 090. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to take a uh, short detour to avoid some bumpy weather. It may delay our arrival in Cali. I will keep you posted. The new flight path will take the 737 east around the storm before heading south again to Cali. Panama Center, Copa 201. It's been 12 minutes since takeoff. Level at 250. The captain tells controllers he's reached cruising altitude at 25,000 feet. Minutes later, the plane disappears from radar. The controller tries the radio, but gets no response. Graciela Okana is one of the controllers on duty. The flight was leaving Panama airspace, entering Colombia airspace. Hopefully it's just interference from the storm. The plane's last known location was over Panama's remote Darien Gap. Their last radar return was here, over the Darien jungle. The plane has vanished over an almost impenetrable jungle. If Copa 201 crashed here, just getting to the crash site will be a huge struggle. Okana reports the missing flight to aviation authorities. Hey, have you had any radio contact with Copa 201? Then comes the news she's been dreading. Early in the morning, I received a call from a radio station in Darien. Any survivors? Witnesses on the ground have reported a terrifying sight. During the night, they saw a big ball of fire falling from the sky. We had to find out where the aircraft was and if there was anyone alive, they could save. The next day, searchers make their way to the crash site. But all 47 of the people on board are dead. At Jakarta Air Traffic Control, Silk Air 185 has vanished from radar. The controller has heard no mayday call. He tries to get a message to the missing flight with the help of another pilot. Indonesia 238, Jakarta. Go ahead, Indonesia 238. Please relay to Silk Air 185 to contact Singapore 134.4. Roger, Indonesia 238. But the 737 is already submerged beneath the murky waters of Indonesia's Musi River, halfway between Jakarta and Singapore. Local villagers report the crash. And they're telling stories about the aircraft coming very fast from, from an altitude. Along the river, people search for survivors, but find only small bits of debris. A 50-ton aircraft carrying 104 people has all but disappeared. News of the Silk Air crash is met with shock in Singapore, home to almost half the passengers. There is very little hope that anyone has survived. Twenty-four hours later, following the crash of Silk Air 185, Indonesian investigator Sentosa Sayogo 
takes charge of the team from the National Transportation Safety Committee. Empty those bags. Put it with the other bags for processing. What we did is to go to the crash site, observe, and then record and preserve anything that uh, we can use for the later investigation. Or small debris. The scale of the disaster soon becomes evident. There are no survivors. All 104 passengers and crew have been killed, including veteran pilot Captain Xu Wei Ming and his first officer Duncan Ward. It was just complete bewilderment as to how it might have happened. In that situation, you go into a complete state of shock. I didn't really know what to believe. Chepecoan's a goalkeeper, Jackson Fullman, has survived the crash of La Mia Flight 2933. I woke up in the middle of the forest. I don't know how long I'd been asleep for. Besides Jackson Fullman, three other Chapacoenza players have survived. 71 people are dead, making this one of the worst tragedies in the history of sport. The morning light reveals the full extent of the crash. The La Mia plane hit the crest of an 8,700-foot mountain called Cerro Gordo. The Colombian Aircraft Accident Investigation Group wastes no time starting their work. The team is on site at daybreak, with Julian Echeverri in charge. It looks like the fuselage spun around 180 degrees. Echeverri and his team work around the clock, collecting evidence in the mountain. Landing gear was down. Look, the flaps are extended. The plane was configured for landing. It's clear that the crew was descending towards the airport. But it crashed 10 miles short of the runway. The investigators have a tough job ahead. Aircraft debris has tumbled down both sides of the mountain. But their biggest clue is what they don't find at the scene of the crash. No scorch marks. No fuel smell either. <sighs> the fuel level indicators are at zero. The plane was out of fuel. The investigators are mystified. Why would the plane have run out of fuel? Was it a fuel leak? Engines one and four are up there. Two and three are here by the main wreckage. All four engines are located and examined. There is no sign of fire or failure. They conclude the engines worked until the fuel ran out. The question is, how did the fuel get so low in the first place? Was it a mechanical failure or human error? Garuda Indonesia Flight 152, who left the Indonesian capital of Jakarta nearly 90 minutes ago. Headed northwest, it's expected to arrive at its destination in about half an hour. Surface winds calm, visibility 400 meters. Present weather, smoke. Forest fires in Sumatra have sent a thick blanket of smoke across all of Southeast Asia. Indonesia 152, turn right heading 046. Turn right heading 046, Indonesia 152. Any second now, the controller expects to see flight 152 turn onto final approach. What? The Airbus has somehow become dangerously close to the ground. Come on, come on, 
Climb! Climb! Investigators gather information from the air traffic controller, the last person to have communicated with Flight 152. They approached from the southeast. I was trying to bring them in this way. A left turn, then a right turn that gets them into runway 05. The controller suspects the captain somehow misinterpreted his instructions and missed the final turn. With no sign of the black boxes, investigators gather air traffic recordings made in the tower. It's hoped they can shed some light on why the plane turned away from the airport instead of towards it. Roll tape. Confirming descent to flight level 140. The air traffic recordings capture only the radio calls between the pilots and the controller. Indonesia 152, descend to 3,000 feet for runway 05. They're not as helpful as a CVR recording, which would reveal all sounds and conversation inside the cockpit. Reduce speed, 220. But investigators listen closely for any clue as to why the A300 veered so badly off course. On heading 215, Indonesia 152. That puts them about here, right on course. One more right turn, and he's lined up with the runway. Indonesia 152, turn right, heading 046. There it is, clear as day. Turn right, heading 046, Indonesia 152. Okay, stop there. They definitely understood, turn right. How the flight went so horribly wrong in the final few moments is baffling. It's in the exact opposite direction they were told. Investigators need the CVR if they hope to figure out what exactly went on in the cockpit of Flight 152. 